Now, an advantage for this is when I used to do this in Brevard, the video screen was behind and over my shoulder. So I wasn't able to see when things weren't looking good. If I'm writing things that do not appear, just speak up and let me know. Um, Cause sometimes I just get in the zone. Uh, I think we're good to go. The first thing that I'm gonna do is talk about the two dimensional motion lab that is coming in, uh, there we go. Oh, I can adjust that, that's awesome. Um, it's coming, you did measurement first lab, one dimensional motion second lab, you're adding vectors today. Adding vectors is good. Um, 2D motion on Monday. I don't think we do, do we have a lab today? And it is 2D motion? No, it's the vectors. Oh, it's the, I'm sorry, it's the vectors. Then you get Friday off from lab and then 2D motion on Monday. I'm just trying to remember the whole thing. Um, with that lab, and really what I'm going to do at the beginning is kind of a two-dimensional motion problem. The first part of the problem is you have a table and you record the height. And really what you're doing is you're recording the height from the base of the table to the point where the steel ball leaves the cannon. And this is one of the few labs where I go, seriously, it could put your eye out. So respect the cannon, don't put your eye up to the gun sight, always have it aiming away from you and everybody should be fine. So this thing comes out with an initial velocity that's unknown. But the one thing that you do know initially is that the angle is flat, that it is shooting perfectly horizontal. This ball goes, descends, and lands a particular distance, I'll call it X. And let's say X was 1.4 meters. So what you do is you, um, you fire this ball, the ball lands, what you have is a, a sheet of paper with, back in the old days they used to put, um, like the copy paper and uh, which is just a big sheet of ink and what ends up happening is it marks the distance and you fire it three or four times. You take the average of those distances and that becomes your X value. So you fire it three times, it lands three times pretty much close to each other and then you mark uh, then you use that value. If the height of the table, let's just say is 0 0.8 meters, it's not going to be 0 0.8. It'll be um, something else. But the thing that you have to do first is, <coughs> I'm trying to find, there we go. All right. The first thing you need to do is you need to find initial velocity. And so this is a very simple two-dimensional motion problem initially. Given that you fired a ball, it lands 1.4 meters away. The height of the table is 0.8 meters. We're on the planet Earth. In 220, in lab, you're gonna use 9.81 or 9.8. Here in class, we're gonna use 10. But the first question is, what's the initial velocity of the ball? That's the first thing you have to find out. It's a two-dimensional motion problem. A lot of people have asked me yesterday, well, how do I solve problems? And I go, well, what kind of problem is it? Well, this is a two-dimensional motion problem. So the first thing you want to do is you want to write out your position equations. X equals X naught plus V naught XT and Y equals Y naught plus V naught YT 
plus one-half AT squared. And so you write those out. The next thing that you do with, like I said before, those five steps I mentioned yesterday that I wrote up on the board, how to do a one-dimensional problem and how to do a two-dimensional problem, are all that you really need to follow as a, as a path for the rest of the, for all the problems that you're doing in 213 and 214. You need to label an origin. So my origin is going to be at the base of the table. And I'm going to declare that as 0, 0. Now in lab, that is the point directly beneath the, uh, when you put the ball, you're going to put the ball in the cannon and you're just going to drop a line directly down to the floor. And that floor, the point of contact, is the origin. It may be slightly underneath the table or you may push the cannon right up to the edge of the table. Um, there's all sorts of possibilities. Now, then what's the next step? You plug in my favorite number, zero. So who can give me a value that's zero? Or a quantity that's zero? Why not? Why not? Um, why not is non-zero. Incorrect, but you said it with confidence, so I do appreciate that fact. If that is the origin, that's why not your y naught value will be 0 0.8. So what is a quantity that's 0? x naught. x naught. it is directly above the origin, so its x value is 0. There are two more values that are 0. Ending velocity. Well, okay. Now, what you... We're going to have a lesson. So, what you said is when it hits the ground, its velocity is zero. Correct. But in terms of what we're doing in this class from a physics perspective, we're not going to choose what I'm engaging in the snark rule. Because if I say, well, what's the velocity the moment or as it hit the ground? You would say, well, it hit the ground. Its velocity is zero. Ha, 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 ha. This is a trick question. And I go, well, coincidentally, that's the number of points that you're going to get for that answer. Ha, 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 joke's on you. So what I'm really interested in, when I say what is the velocity at impact, I am, I'm meaning what is the velocity the moment, it, the moment before it comes to come to it. And so that, what you have asked is a question that I had to address eventually. You just gave me an opportunity to answer. So what are, there are two other values. Neither of which are, uh, one is a velocity, the other one is a position. Why? Why? The final law. It lands on the surface. The surface we have declared as the y equals zero plane. So y final is zero. There's one last value that we know for a fact is zero. Initial velocity. Initial velocity. Well, it does. Well, it's it's. Once again, you're at the opposite line of her question. We're talking about the velocity as it leaves the can. That that is its initial velocity. So let's not let's not get into this whole like what's leading up to and what's after. We're only concerned about this motion. But there is a velocity that is zero in this problem. The y velocity, in fact, the initial y velocity. This thing is fired horizontally. And if I say it's fired horizontally, its initial velocity in the y direction is zero. It's all x. So we can rewrite this. As x equals v naught t, 
and zero equals y naught plus one half at squared. If that's zero, that whole term is zero. Now we identify our knowns and unknown quantities using our green and red markers. Um, and in fact, what I do know, the, the downside of doing it this way is um, green and red don't really show up that differently. If I draw green beneath the letter, it's a known quantity. Um, I don't know any of this. So I'm gonna draw above. I don't know my, oh, I do know my final uh, X, because that's 1.4. I don't know my V naught and I don't know my T. So those are two quantities that I don't know. The left equation has two unknowns. I can't do squat with this. On the right, I have an equation. Um, I do know my Y naught, that's gonna be 1.2. I'm on the planet Earth, that's negative 10 because it's a ballistics problem, which means all we're left with is time. Time is an unknown. But the equation on the right is a one equation, one unknown. That's the weak equation. That's the one we're going to attack. So negative y naught is equal to 1 half at squared, negative 2 y naught over a, is equal to t squared, which means square root of negative two y naught over a is equal to t. Now initially, this, this particular expression does freak people out a little bit because there's a negative sign under the square root, which should cause anybody a little bit of uh, anxiety. However, a is negative 10, so those negatives cancel and it goes away, so it's not a problem. So this becomes negative 2, 0 0.8, negative 10. So this is 1 point, or 0 0.16. 0 0.8 times 2 is 1.6. 1 1.6 1 .6 divided by 10 is 0 0.16. Square root of 0 0.16 is 0.4. That's the amount of time that it takes for it to hit the ground. Now what's really interesting, just as an observation, so I'm not going to do it, but I have two pins. If I drop one pin just straight down and I give this one an initial velocity this way, what will happen is the pins will, the, hold on, let me get this right. The pins will land at the same time because you effectively treat the X motion independently from the Y motion. There, if both objects have an initial Y velocity of zero, both of them will hit the ground at the same time, regardless of the fact that this guy is initially moving sideways they will still hit the ground at the same time. So you must consider Y values independent of X values. Now that you know the time, you can solve for V naught. X divided by T is V naught. So 1.4 divided by 0 0.4 is 3.5. Typically the answers that you get for the velocity of, um, of the experiment is in the twos, threes, and fours meters per second. That's one part. I would consider this a good just small appetizer problem. It won't be the appetizer problem for this test, but it, it's, it's good enough. The next part, what you're going to do is you're going to take that cannon and elevate it to an angle that you determine. In our case, we'll make it 30 degrees since I love 30 degrees in terms of its math. 
Now, because you elevate this cannon, the launch point of the ball elevates just a little bit. And so what we'll do is we'll say that the height is now 0 0.85 meters. So it rises a little bit, probably not as much as five centimeters, but it'll, it'll change just a little bit. You now know that the velocity of the ball is 3.5 meters per second. That is effectively the muzzle velocity of the ball. So it could be fired vertically, horizontally, anywhere in between. It's still gonna launch it at 3.5. You needed to determine that velocity first. The game is that thing is gonna launch and land. The question is, where is that ball gonna land? What you're gonna do is you're gonna take an other sheet of paper similar to the one that you used in the first part of the experiment and you're gonna mark out a distance that you calculate. You're gonna do the math that I'm about to give you right now and you're gonna calculate that distance X. And then you're gonna mark that distance on the floor from the launch point of the ball and you're gonna put your sheet of paper and right at that distance, you're gonna write a line. The goal is you're gonna fire that gun and that ball is gonna land exactly where you marked it because it's physics, it works. Um, so now, we have another type of two-dimensional motion problem. What do you do as you do always? I set the origin at the base. Why? I always pick lower left. Um, occasionally I pick another place. But you pick one origin and that's you go with it. It doesn't really matter where. You write out your position equations. X equals X naught plus V naught X T y equals y naught plus v naught y t plus one half a t squared. a again is negative 10. Because this is a two-dimensional motion problem and it was launched at an angle This is V naught Y and that is V naught X. Now V naught X is the adjacent side to the angle. So it's related to cosine theta. Cosine theta is V naught X over V naught or V naught X is V naught cosine theta. V naught Y is the opposite side to theta. Sine of theta is V naught Y over V naught so V naught Y is V naught sine theta. We plug in our zeros. Our X naught is zero. Our Y final is zero. Uh, y naught is non-zero and that's all we got. So let's substitute in V naught X. V naught Y and then we have a one half AT squared. So we get this. Now, once again, lather, rinse, repeat, identify what we know and don't know. In this particular case, we don't know what X is. We also don't know what time is. Uh, I do know what V naught and A are. I do know what Y naught is. This is a one equation, one unknown. This is a one equation, two unknown. So I'm going to attack this problem first. And the way that I'm gonna do it, and it brings up another lesson, is I'm going to rearrange it and put it in quadratic form that we typically use when we're about to solve stuff with it. 
V naught sine theta t plus y naught. And now I'm going to plug in stuff. A is negative 10 divided by 2, negative 5. V naught is 3.5 sine of 30. is one half, so this is 1.75t. I think that's right. Yeah. And then y naught is the adjusted height of 0 0.85. Now this is in quadratic form. Let me, let me go over uh, Eschenberg Physics 213 policy on quadratic uh, equations. This is physics class. It is not math. When you do homework and you've got this quadratic stuff, you can use an app, you can use whatever you need, you can write it out by hand. I have no problem with it. In lab, you can use the equation, use an app, use whatever. I think. What I have found is a lot of people spend a lot of time trying to solve the quadratic equation by hand and it wastes time that should be spent on, learn, on doing the problems during a test. So during tests, the quadratic equation will not be necessary or required to do the problems. I will have it set up so that it will never be used. There are problems where you could use it but the problem will be set up to where you don't have to use it. It's just a waste of time in my opinion. So I've got an app for that. Let's see, negative five. Oop. You're not as fast as I want. Now, the solutions for t, 0 0.623 seconds and negative 0 0.273 seconds. Now, what this thing is doing is it's solving this equation, and there are two solutions for it, but one is negative and one is positive. One is nonsensical, you can't do negative time from the way that we're doing it. But if it was, if you were allowed to roll back uh, the motion picture and see the object penetrate the table, it would land on the floor 0.273 seconds back from when it when it launched which doesn't make any sense so the solution that we're going to use is 0.623 seconds that makes t a known quantity which now allows us to do this x equals v naught cosine theta T or 3.5 cosine 30, 0 0.623. So 1.89 meters. So what you do is you sit there and you put a piece of paper at 1.89 meters with a line right at that value. And then you fire the cannonball three or four times. In a perfect world, that ball will land at 1.89 meters every <coughs> single time. And it won't fail. This is the lab. This is the lab that you work on. If you take this math that I gave you and you plug in your values for what you got into these equations, 
All you gotta do is run the new numbers and this will give you the new value for how far, for where it's gonna land. I've done the lab for you. All you gotta do now is just run through um, the values. But the one thing that we, one of the things that we need to observe, a lot of people want to have like, they think that there is one specific solution and they've got to learn all 500 different solutions to all 500 different types of physics problems. What I'm trying to teach you is the general procedure on how to solve problems. What did I do? First thing I said is, it's a 2D motion problem. What do I do because of that? I write out the X and Y position equations. Well, what's the next thing? Oh, I pick the origin. Well, what's the next thing? I plug in my zeros. And what's the next thing? I identify what I know and don't know. Well, what's the next thing? Well, I see if one of the equations has one unknown and solve for that and then work the other equation, or it's a two equation, two unknown problem. In physics 213 test one material, all of it, all the problems that you do have a very set list for the procedure, all of it. If you follow the rules, it will never fail. It's, it's the really creative physics, let me tell you, is way, is a couple more years away from now. This is just to get you into the basics. Right now, we're in the kiddie pool with the floaties on. It is not, it, you're not going to die. So we have studied conversions, which will be tested one-dimensional motion, which will kind of be a part of what we're going to talk in the next hour and a half. Vector addition, know your vector addition, backwards and forwards. Uh, look at that specific tutorial. I worked most of the problems in that tutorial uh, for the problem set that you got. All I'm really doing is just stripping off the due date and putting on the new your uh, due date. Um, so it's nothing, it is nothing new. And then um, what we're gonna talk about now, which leads up to Atwood's machines and forces. Starting tomorrow, we're gonna do review. Because after I get done with this today, we've effectively covered all the new material for test one, and we did it in six hours. That's amazing. But what we're gonna do in, the, in Friday and on Monday is we're gonna let the concrete set. All that information, for the last three days, we've been sitting there trying to drink from a fire hose. Now, we're gonna take Friday, the weekend, and Monday, and just reinforce everything. How do we do that? Practice and repetition. That's all it is. So let's talk about this. We've learned about position. We have learned about time. When you put position and time together, you can get velocity, which is just the change in position with respect to time. If you plug in T again, you get acceleration. Acceleration is the change in V with respect to time. And what we're going to do now is we're going to add a new quantity or a quantity that we're quite familiar with, mass, and get those two together. And what they produce is what we're going to talk about now. So the way that I kind of teach it is... So, right now this book is doing nothing. And what you'll come to learn is the fact that, well, the, for the people who are listening to this, there's a book resting on the table, not doing anything. The fact that it's not doing anything means it's doing a lot, a lot of very interesting things. Unless I do that. 
So if this book is just sitting there, it will sit there unless I F it. Now, if we were in space, this book would not be under the influence of gravity. It would just sit there. So if it was in motion, it would just sit there and move forever. So a lot of times in our particular field in physics, we kind of generalize things. And so when I say you've got a universe where there's only a book moving through it, you should just say, okay, fine. There's a wide open space. There's a book moving freely with it. And it would continue moving on its happy little way unless I F with it. So an object in motion stays in motion unless you F with it. An object at rest stays at rest unless you F with it. Now what I've said is kind of a vague, um, vague statement for Newton's first law. An object in motion stays in motion unless it meets a force. An object at rest stays at rest unless it experiences a force. What did you think I meant by F? You thought I said a dirty word, didn't you? So the F, one of the things I like to do that, it gets people's attention, and so then you explain it, and then you can associate it. So things cannot, things will either stay where they are or move on as they happily choose to go unless they experience a force. And so that is Newton's first law. So Newton's first law, and you know how I hate to write stuff down, so if I ri actually write stuff down, it's important. Object motion stays in motion, object at rest stays at rest unless it experiences a force. That's Newton's first law. It introduces the idea of the word force. Now Newton's second law says force is the product of the object's mass times its acceleration. I'm getting lazy, so I'm just going to shorten it. So if you take the mass and acceleration, you get force. So this is where F equals MA. That is Newton's second law. Now you can solve for this equation. You can, if I give you the force and acceleration, you can get the mass. If I give you uh, mass and force, you can get the acceleration of the object. What's typically a force? A force is usually a push or a pull, a rocket engine, um, engine in a car. All of these are applying forces to the object or objects causing an acceleration. If we want to know the units, M is in kilograms. A is in meters per second squared. So the units of force are in kilograms, meters per second per second. 
or what we call a Newton, which we use as capital N. The Newton is the unit of force in the metric system. And one Newton is equal to one kilogram meter per second per second. That's the conversion. Now for Newton's, there is a Newton's third law. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction which basically can be easily demonstrated everybody tends to do this in the middle of the night when I do it I typically post it to Twitter is sometimes I think I can take my foot and pass it through the bedpost and it doesn't work if I push on this table the table pushes back on my foot. If I push down on the table, the table pushes back. Now these are going to start introducing some new ideas. If, just take this stapler, put it on the table, what do I know for a fact that this thing is not doing? It's not, it's not moving. It's doing nothing. Well, what can you get from that? Well, we are on the planet Earth. So there is a force pulling down on this stapler. How do I know? Because I can just drop it. There's a force acting on each of you. But just like this stapler, you're not going into the floor at all. There's a push back. The table is pushing back on the stapler just as the stapler is pushing on the table. This introduces the idea of translational Translational equilibrium. If you're looking at something and it is not accelerating, the sum of the forces, see this is written when you only have one force acting on an object. If you have multiple forces acting on an object, which is most of the time, you use sum of the forces. Sum of the forces, which is equal to mass times acceleration. Acceleration in translational equilibrium is zero. So the sum of the forces is equal to zero. That's a horrible zero, but let's just roll with it. Well, let's just simply talk about the stapler resting on the table. So what do we know about the object. We're on the planet Earth. So there is a force due by or um, force um, caused by gravity. I typically call this the gravity force. Gravity force, mass times acceleration, I use mg. <coughs> G, in this case, is positive 10 meters per second per second. I treat G as a magnitude. Remember in two-dimensional motion ballistics, I use A. A in ballistics is negative G. G, you treat that as a magnitude. A is pulled down 
So it has a magnitude of 10 down or negative 10. And so that's where the negative 10 comes from. So if I simply asked for, let's say this is a two kilogram stapler, the force of gravity is two times 10 or 20 newtons down. If I wrote it as a vector, it would be negative 20 y hat newtons. But most of the time, I just say 20 newtons down, and that simplifies things. What's the thing that I know about this book or the stapler? It's not penetrating the table which means there has to be another force pushing up on the book so that the book doesn't move. This force I call F sub N. F sub N, so this is F sub G gravity force, F sub N is what we call normal force. Now let's talk about what normal is. Normal is not, we're not referring to this particular normal as the opposite of abnormal. Normal in this case is a, um, it's a mathematical term. A line that is normal to a surface is perpendicular to the surface. So my pin here is normal to the top of the book. The pin here is now normal to the side of the table. This pin here is normal to the surface of my head at that point. So it could be a normal vector can point in all sorts of directions, but the one thing it has to do is be perpendicular to the surface. That's the, that's the core of the, of the word. So I know there has to be another force and that force is the normal force. So we get this. Really what I've done here is I've drawn a force diagram. I know it's not moving in the vertical, so I can write some of the forces in Y are equal to zero. Now I could, at this particular point, I could write the sum of the forces in X are equal to zero because it's not moving side to side, but that's unuseful because there's no horizontal forces in this particular example. And I write the sum of the forces as the normal force minus the force in, uh, force of gravity. Now, a lot of you in the, a lot of students in the past have said, well, why don't you make G negative and let that propagate through? Well, what I like to do is I like to keep my minus signs out front where I can watch them because minus signs are shifty and they can't be trusted. Here I know that the force of gravity is down. Therefore, I use my brain and I put a minus sign in front of that mg. I know that fn is up, so there is a positive sign in front of that fn. There are worlds, like in uh, if you do the um, super monkey uh, problem or if you do the Taylor Swift problem, you can set it up so that down is positive one-dimensional motion problems, you are allowed to do that as a technique. It's one of the reasons why I put my minus signs out front because if you're dealing with minus signs sitting inside equations, you're gonna have to keep track of, am I taking a minus sign of a minus sign of a minus sign and then I get confused and then I just wanna go to the square for the rest of the afternoon. 
So I keep those minus signs out front. So I know that Fn is equal to Fg. The magnitude of the normal force is equal to the magnitude of the gravity force. So the normal force is mg, which means it is 20 newtons up, or positive 20 y hat newtons. So it could be that way. Now one of the other questions that we have on uh, multiple choice, so let's say this book is two kilograms. And that means that as it is right now, there's a 20 Newton normal force pushing up. Well, what happens if I push down on the book? What happens to the normal force? It increases. If the normal force remained 20 Newtons, the book would penetrate, but it didn't, which means that the normal force increases. It changes to whatever it takes to keep that equilibrium the same. So if I push down, the normal force increases. If I slightly lift up, the normal force decreases until eventually, what's the normal force on the desk? Nothing, or from the desk, nothing. So it increases, 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 decrease, 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 zero. And so that's a description of how the normal force works. The next thing, so um, let's do another problem. And actually, let me get a new sheet here. If I have an object, its mass is two kilograms, and there is a force of 20 newtons being applied. I want the final coordinate and I want the final velocity if time is 10 seconds and the initial velocity is equal to zero. So you have a block, the initial velocity is zero, you apply a 20 newton force to a two kilogram object. Um, where is it and what is its final velocity? Is this a 1D motion problem or 2D motion problem? 2D? You said it with confidence, I appreciate that. It's very much wrong. Does it travel in the vertical? I'm just, it's just moving from side to side. So no, it doesn't move in the vertical, so it's a one-dimensional motion problem. One dimensional motion problem. What do I need to do? I need to write down x equals x naught plus v naught x t plus one half a t squared and v equals v naught plus a t. Well, why am I writing a now? Whereas in the ballistics problems, I don't. Gravity doesn't exist in the horizontal. That's why a is zero for the ballistics. There is a force now acting in the horizontal, so there better be a non-zero acceleration term. I identify my origin. I'm gonna pick the starting point of the block as the origin, which means when I plug in my zeros, really technically that could just be V naught. That goes away, that goes away, and that goes away. I technically don't know what A is, and I technically don't need to know what A is, because if I know that F is equal to MA, I know that A is F over M. Therefore, X is one half F over M T squared, and V equals F over M T. One of the techniques that we use in problem solving is a lot of times we don't know what a value is, but we can substitute an equation in for something that we don't know. So this introduces the idea of substitution. Now that we have this, we identify what we know and don't know. Um, I know time, I know F, 
I know M, I, I've got everything that I need. I can solve for V and X at the same time. So in this particular case, we have one half 20 over two, kind of cheated because this A is 10. 10 divided by five, or two is five, five divided by a hunt or five times 100 is 500 meters. So at a particular time T, it's going to have um, be at a half kilometer down range. For this, it is 20 divided by two times 10. Its final velocity will be 100 meters per second. That's just the general procedure. So we're able to manipulate the motion equations with Newton's laws. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add, it's the same, um, same problem, but now, and let me write it, mu sub k is equal to 0 0.4. I want X and V. So what does all this mean, this mu sub K? When you have objects, see, I don't really like the book, but I do use it as a prop from time to time. Any door stop, news occurs. When I move this, so let's say I give it an initial velocity. What happens? It slows down, comes to a stop. Well, what's going on? There's friction. When you're looking at the surface of the book compared to the surface of the table, it's not smooth. It's rough. There are divots in the, in the table. There are mountains and ridges in the, in the book. And sometimes they collide. And when they collide, they cause these microscopic moments where it kind of catches and slows it down a little bit. On a grand scale, we use the coefficient of friction to kind of approximate what this value is. If it's a very smooth surface, it's close to zero. If it's a more sticky surface, the numbers increase. The numbers, the numbers don't have a set limit. But if you're dealing with something that's like on the order of mu sub k of two, you got a really sticky sub uh, surface. Ice skating rings, 0.05, something like that, maybe a little bit larger. But when you've got this, it slows down and eventually comes to a stop. In this particular case, we are starting from zero but what I've done is I've set the horizontal force to be greater than the friction force. And this is how I'm going to show it. When you have an object, that's moving. And the way that I do it is I write my V and the arrow of the, uh, the V is to the right, you can do it with or without the vector. I'm not picky at this moment. You have the force of gravity going down. You also have the normal force. The normal force is perpendicular to that of the surface. And then you have friction force. F sub F is always, oh, that's horrible. Let me rewrite it.
F sub F is always opposite of velocity. If the velocity is to the right, friction force is to the left. If velocity is to the left, friction force is to the right. Now, one of the words that I tend to use is this, I'll write the symbol that. Two arrows where on the left, the arrow part is on the upside, on the right, the arrow is on the downside. This is what I would call anti-parallel. When you've got two vectors that are going in the same direction, which I typically write that symbol as that, then those are para parallel. Now we're all familiar with just the idea of parallel. They just run side by side. But when you get into physics, you need to know when you've got vectors running side by side, are they going in the same direction or in opposite directions? If they're the same direction, it's parallel. If they're in opposite directions, it's anti-parallel. It's something that we'll be using throughout the summer. Just a, just a phrase that I'll be throwing out that you guys need to know. Friction force is always anti-parallel to the velocity, always in the opposite direction. In this case, the velocity is to the right, the friction force is to the left. The relationship between normal force and friction force is friction force is mu sub k times fn. So the friction force is this factor mu sub k times fn. Mu sub k is the coefficient of kinetic friction. When objects are in motion and you need to work with the friction force, you use the coefficient mu sub k. There's another one, mu sub s, which is the coefficient of static friction. The coefficient of kinetic friction is friction that's used when objects are in motion. Static friction is when objects are not in motion. The perfect example of um, static friction, this book that I have, I've placed a stapler on top, and when I raise the book at an angle, if this was a very smooth, frictionless surface, the stapler would immediately slide down the hill. So what's the force keeping the stapler from going down the hill? Static friction. As I increase the angle, you can see it to start to slide. But eventually I'll get this thing to slide. The moment it starts moving, we transition from static friction to kinetic friction. At a particular angle, the force, and we're going to talk about this in greater detail, the force down the plane of the book is greater than the friction force holding the book up. When that happens, it starts to slide. When that sliding occurs, we've switched from static friction to kinetic friction. So if I said, you've got an object sliding across the floor, mu sub s or k, uh, mu sub s or mu sub k, you say I'm only interested in mu sub k. If you've got um, a car sitting on uh, an inclined plane, are you more concerned about kinetic friction or static friction? You say static friction. If I say, well, what, you've got the car on a hill, how much kinetic friction is there? Your answer is it doesn't exist because it's not moving. 
So those are the differences. If it's moving, you use mu sub k. If it, um, if it isn't moving, you use mu sub s. There are different numbers for like the uh, mu sub s for a stapler on a book is going to be different from mu sub k of a stapler on a book. So those numbers will change. Typically, static friction coefficients are greater than kinetic. So in this particular problem, I have a 20 Newton force pulling to the right. It's causing a velocity to the right. I've got a normal force, a gravity force, and a friction force. This friction force is mu sub k times normal force or 0 0.4 times um, the normal force which we've determined to be 20. So this is 8 newtons. So the object is experiencing 20 newtons to the right, a pull of 20 newtons to the right, and a friction force of 8 newtons to the left. Now, if the force to the left was greater than the force to the right, the thing wouldn't even start to move. The friction force would be greater than the, for than the pull. But because the force to the left is less than the force to the right, this thing's going to accelerate to the right. It's a one-dimensional problem. X equals X naught plus V naught XT plus one-half a t squared and y equals y naught plus v naught y t. You plug in your, um, whoa, don't do that. V equals v naught x plus a t. I was doing a two dimensional ocean problem. It starts from rest. The object is just, um, has just uh, blah, 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 um, overcome static friction. X naught is zero, V naught X is uh, zero. My A, because we're dealing with multiple forces, MA is equal to the sum of the forces in X, which is equal to that 20 Newton force minus the 8 Newton force. So there is now, it's not a 20 Newton force to the right, it's now a 12 Newton force to the right. So acceleration is now 12 divided by m or 12 divided by 2 or 6 meters per second squared. And you do the same thing. The equations don't change. It's just the numbers that you plug in. V is equal to AT, which is equal to 6 <coughs> times, the time that I used was 10. So 60 meters per second. So instead of traveling at 100 meters per second, the friction has caused it to only get to 60 meters per second. X equals one half AT squared. So this is one half six, 10 squared or 300 meters. And so by introducing the idea of, by introducing friction, we've effectively slowed things down. We've reduced its velocity. Now, what we've done is we've used forces on a flat surface. What we're going to look at now are forces 
on an inclined plane. So there is an angle theta. And what we're going to do is we're going to show you how this You rewrite the problem so it looks like that. So it's flat. So it approximates a one-dimensional motion problem. This is a lot, this is very similar to um, when my niece was a year old under the supervision of her mother, I would hold her upside down. <laughs> so that she'd look at the world at a whole new perspective. And it was funny because after I got done not dropping her, and I put her back in her in her little her chair, she would sit there and try to do this. Like she would try to adjust her perspective of the world. And what I need you to do is when you look at something like this, and you need to think of it in an easier way, what you really do is you take a look at that and then you tilt your head so that it approximates a motion. X, our, our um, variable of motion, is no longer running left to right. It's running upper right, or I'm sorry, upper left to lower right. And so let's show how we can change things to make it appear more simple. Let's draw first a force diagram of what's going on. And what I'm gonna do is, since I've got the paper, might as well. Um, I'm gonna draw a big, let's do this. And what you will notice on the, uh, the test is there will be a picture like this. It's a horrible block. But oh. There'll be a block like this and there will be a force diagram and there will be multiple choice questions where you have to identify which one has a particular value. If this is the angle theta, Gravity still exists. Gravity is in a pure vertical motion. <coughs> now, what we're going to do is we're going to take this vector, this force vector of gravity, and I'm going to break it into this. I have now a coordinate system that's running parallel and perpendicular to the motion like this. So here, the X and Y doesn't look sensible. Here, it does. So what I do this is F G Y This is F, G, X, and this is F, G, which is just M, G. So it looks a lot like this. The next thing is the normal force. Now, normal force is not opposite of this normal force is always perpendicular to the surface. So it is technically, in this particular case, opposite of FGY. So the normal force looks like that. And then you have, if in this case, velocity is downhill, then friction force is uphill. If velocity was uphill, friction force would be downhill. Friction force is always opposite of the velocity. And this is the force diagram. Now, there is a 
There is a way that we can prove it. I'm not interested in the proof. But that angle theta is this angle theta. This, if I said that's 30 degrees, then that's 30 degrees. And so what we have here is an inclined plane that if you rotate it like this, it looks... a lot like that problem. Where now FGX is the pull force, FGY is just FG, FG has been broken into these two. The normal forces still appear to be the same and the friction force appears to be the same. So all we've done is we've rotated this inclined plane to look like a flat surface and something that we've done before. Now these particular steps that I'm about to go through, I want to see you do these on problem sets and on tests. It's important to go through the repetition. Now you've just started doing this. I've been doing this for years and even I will still continue to do it because it's important for you to see it and it's important for you to uh, repeat it and practice it and understand it. Step one is find FGX and FGY. Find those components of the gravity force. Now that's theta, that's the adjacent side, so cosine of theta is equal to FGY over FG. So FGY is equal to FG cos theta or mg cos theta. Sine of theta is fgx over fg. So fgx is equal to fg sine theta, which is mg sine theta. And so those are the forces in the x and the y axis. Now some of you are asking yourselves, where are the numbers? I gotta have my numbers. No, I'm not giving you any numbers right now. The important thing is understanding the equations. If you understand the equations, I don't care about the numbers. The numbers you can get, the numbers you can calculate, the numbers you can use your calculator on, it'll be fine. These steps are identical to all inclined plane problems. Next, find normal force. Well, the normal force is opposite of FGY. The sum of the forces in Y are equal to zero, which is equal to FN minus F, G, Y. One of the things that we do is that we treat now we treat up into the left as negative, down into the right as positive. Up into the right as positive, down into the left as negative. We're treating this as the ax or axes, not the typical vertical x and uh, vertical y and horizontal x. This lets us know that the normal force is equal to FGY, so the normal force is MG cos theta. That's the normal force. Part three, find friction force. By definition, the friction force is mu sub k times the normal force. So this is mu sub k mg cos theta. 
So we found the friction force. Four. Find A. Find its value. See if it's going left or right. In this particular case, we know this thing's going down and to the right, so A should be positive in this case. Find A. The sum of the forces is equal to MA. The two forces that I have is the force of gravity pulling down and to the right. The other force is friction force pulling up and to the left. So this makes it minus F sub F plus FGX. So MA is equal to minus mu sub K MG cos theta plus MG sine theta. Each term has a mass term, so they cancel out. And what I'm left with is A is equal to G, and I'm going to do some arranging inside, sine of theta minus mu sub K cosine theta. You can now get the acceleration for any set of coefficients of uh, friction or theta, anything like that. So if I gave you the numbers, now you just plug it in. The other thing that we need to note is Dr. Eschenberg does know that you do love your numbers. And Dr. Eschenberg tends to write problems where it will frustrate the plug and chuggers. If I had simply asked for, given this situation, what's the acceleration of the block on the inclined plane, and I didn't give you mass. If I said, all I want is the acceleration. Seriously, I can give you normal force, I can give you friction force. No, I'm not interested in that. All I want is acceleration but you didn't give us mass. And I would say, yes, I didn't give you mass. It's a correctly constructed problem. It will be something that you will hear frequently. If, I, if you ask, you didn't give us mass, and I say, yes, I know, what does that imply? That you don't need it. This equation here is mass independent. There is no function of mass, or there is no variable of mass in it. It's unnecessary to calculate A. It's unnecessary to know what the mass is if I'm only asking for A. Now, if I ask for friction force or normal force, then yes, you're going to have to know what M is. But in this particular case, no. And then what you do is, for these types of equations, you use X equals X naught plus V naught X T plus one half A T squared and V equals V naught X plus A T. You take that A into there and you do the same thing as before. You plug in your zeros, you identify what you know and don't know, and then the whole thing comes through. Let's just say uh, let's do something similar to what uh, we did on, um, or that you guys are going to do on the problem set. If the initial velocity was 3 meters per second and mu sub k was 0 0.2 and um, theta was, I do love 30 degrees, 30 degrees and the length down the hill is... 12 meters, how long does it take for it to get down and what is its final velocity? So we can just do that. Um, oh, and I can, I'll be nice and I'll say, well, what's the value of A? Well, we've already done the derivation. The derivation for the three inclined, uh, inclined plane problems are the same. And I do want you to go and do it three different times just to get it in. Repetition is the key. So I have A, A 10 sine 30 minus 0 0.2 
cosine 30 will give me an A of and I may end up, this is the problem with doing problems on the fly. No, I'm good. All right, it is 3.27 meters per second per second. And it is a positive. In problems like this, it is possible to get a negative answer because the thing could be slowing down. The gravity force or the friction force could be sufficiently enough to slow it down. Um, in the problem set, one of these has a negative A, I believe. In all three cases of inclined planes, they all make it to the bottom. So I don't give you one. I, it does say, well, what's, where does it stop? No, it doesn't stop. It always goes to the bottom. So this means that X, what you do is you treat the origin at the top to be zero. X equals X naught plus V naught XT plus one half AT squared and V equals V naught plus AT. Uh, X naught is zero. This will be quadratic. So zero equals one half AT squared plus V naught XT minus X. And I'll just say that, yeah, the length down here is 12. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set this up and then we could just plug it in later. It doesn't really matter. So this is one half A, 3.27 over two T squared. So that's the A that you put in your quadratic uh, solution thing. V is um, whatever I said it initially. Wait, there it is, three. And then that uh, B is three and then C is negative 12. So you plug that into your quadratic solver, solve for T. Uh, most likely you're gonna have one that's negative and one that's positive. Choose the positive and then take that into there and then you just plug and chug. Then the rest is just, now we're in your domain, plugging numbers in, you love that. So plug in the numbers and everything will be fine. The reason why I've got to move on to the next topic is I'm gonna need 20 minutes to, to do this. Um, on the test, you will get something that looks like this. equals something. Uh, v naught is equal to zero. Um, what I want to know is, I want to know the acceleration of the system and I want to know the time that it takes for it to reach the bottom. So there is friction, boo friction, and all I want to know is, well, what's the acceleration of the system? This is an Atwood's machine. And yes, this will be on the test. An Atwood's machine is simple. You've got a pulley there. You've got one block resting on the table. You've got another block hanging from the string. You let go of the system, the hanging block falls, the block on the table slides. The question is how long does it take for the hanging block to reach the bottom and hit the surface? That's all I want to know on the test. Now the amazing thing, we've been covering physics for three days and we've gone from a complete stop to Atwood's machines. If I gave you a number line and I said, well, give me the conventional ways of um, 
of marking this number line, you would say, well, left is negative and right is positive. An Atwood's machine technically is a two-dimensional motion problem. The block on the table is moving left, right. The block vertically is moving up, down. But they're, what are they both doing? They're moving along the string. They're effectively attached. They both have the same velocity. They move as one. They will have the same acceleration. So what an Atwood's machine does to its axis is it bends it in 90 degrees. So that on the vertical, or I'm sorry, on the horizontal surface, left is negative and right is positive. On the vertical surface, down is positive and up is negative. So if this thing has a velocity that is up, it has a negative velocity. If it's moving down, it's positive. If this one is moving to the left, it has a negative velocity. If it's moving to the right, it has a positive velocity. I did it one time and I forgot and I used minus positive, positive, minus, and the equation blew up. It has to be this way because it affects, think of it effectively as you've got one mass there, you got another mass there, and that mass has a force on it. This has friction, so there's a force on that. There's no difference between this problem and then bending it 90 degrees and thinking about it that way. So let's focus solely on what's going on right around the masses. Now that string has a tension, it's tight. If it wasn't tight, the masses would either pull together or if it was too tight, it would snap apart. So there's a particular tension in the rope. This tension in the rope, the tension pulling on this block to the right is the same tension pulling up on that block. It's because the, uh, the string is basically just one piece, one object, if those tensions were different, it would either rip apart or bunch up. On this particular object, there is only the force of gravity. There is force of gravity here. But the key difference is this force of gravity is acting in the axis of motion. Oop, not you. In this case, it's acting perpendicular to the axis of motion. Because there's a force of gravity, there is a, um, uh, what to choose, what to choose. There's a normal force, and then there is a friction force. When we're first doing these Atwood's machine motion problems, the, um, this object will always be sufficient to pull that object to the right, and that object will fall. In all of these cases, M2 will hit the ground. Well, what we need to do is we need to write, we need to sum the forces on all of these such that what we're going to do is we're going to get an acceleration from there and an acceleration from there. And we know those A's are the same. I don't differentiate between the T's because the tensions in this case are the same. So for one, step one, we got to find, we got to find our normal force. 
the normal force minus the force of gravity is equal to zero, which is the sum of the forces in the y. It's not moving vertically. So we can safely say that the force of gravity is equal to the normal force, and so the normal force is m1g. Part two, find friction force. Friction force is defined as mu sub k times normal force. So this is mu sub k m1g. So we now have the friction force. And now we write this, the sum of the forces in the axis of motion, which is m1a, is equal to positive t minus mu sub k m1g. Newton's second law, sum of the forces is equal to ma. Well, what forces do we have? We have friction force to the left, mu sub k m1g, and we have tension to the right. But we don't know tension. Don't worry, we'll take care of it. So I can rewrite this as m1a plus mu sub k m1g is equal to t. So that's for ob the tension in the string. If you knew acceleration and mu sub k and m sub 1, you could get the tension in the string. For mass 2, it looks a lot easier. The sum of the forces, which is equal to ma, there is no normal force, so we're just dealing with m2a. Well, what forces are acting on this object? Tension of the string, which is up, which is a negative direction in this case, positive m2g, gravity is pulling down. In this particular case, the, um, the direction of motion is towards the floor which is, in this case, a positive direction. Rearranging this, T is equal to M2A, oh, minus M2A plus M2G. Because that moves over here, that moves over there, and I got a tension. If we were to do our knowns and unknowns, the two unknowns in these equations are acceleration and tension. In the homework, I ask you to find what tension is. Basically, I'm trying to get you to have uh, practice with two equations, two unknowns. In this particular case, I don't care about the tension. All I'm trying to do is get to acceleration. So what I do is I set those t's are equal to each other. So m1a plus mu sub k m1g is equal to m2g minus m2a. I've eliminated t. The only unknown in this particular case is a. Solve for a. m1a plus m2a is equal to m2g minus mu sub k m1g. Why is it not A1 and A2? Because the accelerations of those objects are identical. Solve for A, M1 plus M2, G, M2 minus mu sub k, M1. So A is equal to G, M2 minus mu sub k, M1 over m1 plus m2. And so for the problem that we have with one object on the table, one object hanging down, this is the value of acceleration if there's friction on the table. What I want you to do for this particular problem on the test, it's going to be exactly like this. So the first thing I would do is master getting to that A. It is going to be a flat incline plane. I know that there, the, uh, there are three Atwoods machine problems, uh, seven, eight, and nine in problem set three. 
Problem eight is the one that you really need to focus on. Problems seven and nine are special cases just to push the boundaries of your knowledge and get you to practice. What you should be able to do with this particular problem is be able to solve for any variable I ask for. Solve for M1, solve for M2, solve for mu sub k, solve for g, all of it. Because you don't know what variable I'm going to ask for on the test. The second part of the problem, now that you have A, it becomes a simple one-dimensional problem. If you know what A is, and you know what that distance L is, well, I'll call it X, and you know that the initial velocity is equal to zero, then all you need is X equals X naught plus V naught T plus one half A T squared. X naught and V naught are both zero. I'm gonna say that the origin is at the starting point and down is positive, just like we did it in the Atwoods machine problem. Say that that is down and X is equal to one half A T squared or two X over A is equal to T squared or square root of two X over A is equal to T. So that is equal to whatever we get here. Numerically, take that number, plug it in there, take that value X, and there you go. So if we had a situation where, let's say M2 was 20, mu sub K was 0 0.2, um, that distance X is 20, uh, M1 is five, G is 10, that's all we need. So A is equal to 10, M2, 20, minus 0 0.2 times five, not a very interesting number. M1, five plus 20, that gives us Seven point six meters per second square. In this particular case, the time would be two times twenty divided by seven point six, and it's seven point six exact, which is interesting. Two times twenty divided by seven point six. We'll probably get a nasty number now. Two point two nine seconds. So with this particular mass arrangement and friction, you would, it would just end up being 2.29 seconds with an acceleration of 7.6. In this case, in this particular case for the Atwoods machine, there are no external forces aside from gravity. So if there are no external forces aside from gravity, what is the largest value of acceleration that you can get for this type of Atwood's machine problem? I think I heard somebody. It's 10. That's the biggest number. You can't drop something and have it accelerate faster than gravity. So it has to be a number between zero and 10. This thing will go to the right and down. Its acceleration will be positive. If you get a negative number, it's one of two things. Either A, you made a mistake, or B, I've messed up the numbers. But by the time we get to the test, I, uh, I tend to have everything done on spreadsheets and the numbers work out beautifully. So if you get a number that is like 12, you've messed up. If you got a number that's negative two, you've messed up. Let me teach you one of the things that I do that tends to annoy students Let's say that I just want A for this. And I'm going to say that M2 is equal to four times M1, mu sub K is equal to 0 0.2. I've done this on a test and people have lost their ever loving minds. And they go, but you didn't give us the mass. And I go, I know. 
but you didn't give us anything. I know, I'm fine with that. What you come to find out is I gave you the ratio between the masses and that's the more important thing of the problem. If I say M2 is four times M1, let's take a look at this. G four M1 minus mu sub K M1 over M1 plus 4M1. I simply did a substitution. Remember, I mentioned that as a technique earlier. If you don't know what's going on, you may end up having to do a substitution. Factor out the M1. M1G 4 minus mu sub K over 5M1. Well, golly gee, you got an M1 in the numerator, you got an M1 in the denominator, those M1s cancel. And you're left with G over 5, 4 minus mu sub K. One of the things that you need to know about Dr. Eschenberg and a lot of physics professors, we're just like students. Some people call it lazy. I call it efficient. A lot of times I'll do these weird substitutions to reward the people who practice the alphabet soup method of doing problems. It's much easier to do this calculation than the other one, wouldn't you agree? So this is 10 divided by five. Oh my goodness, that's two. This is four minus 0 0.2 or 3.8. So 3.8 times two 7.6, it's the same answer. Because the ratio of M2 to M1 was four. And so I remembered that and just wrote up in this other problem. So this is a problem that next Tuesday, you're gonna have to manipulate and understand how all the letters work. You're gonna have to master algebraic manipulation, a little bit of trig, all that stuff. Um, the one thing that I will say about it, the story behind this is in Turner Center, I gave a test and someone said, during the test, you told us in the review session that there wouldn't be an Atwood's machine problem. And I said, A, no, I never said that. And B, you have just guaranteed that the class will do an Atwood's machine problem in every single test in 213 until it gets it right, which means we're gonna do this forever. So Atwood's machine similar to this will be on the test. Atwood's machine similar to this will be on the final and things similar to that will be on test two and three. That's it, have a good day.